After completed his three-month assignment, my husband, John, returned home. But not alone. He had brought his mistress, Jessica, with him and said to me with an air of casual cruelty, I got her pregnant, so I want a divorce. And you know, with the expenses coming up, let's just agree to no alimony, okay? His words were like a cold blade, slicing through the air of our once warm home. I replied, keeping my voice steady despite the turmoil within. Fine by me. I'll gladly give you a divorce. John and Jessica celebrated their victory. Unaware of the storm brewing in my mind, they laughed and hugged each other, thinking they had won. But as I watched them, a fierce determination flared up inside me. They have no idea what they just unleashed. I thought, my name is Michelle, a 30-year-old homemaker, dedicated to my family and home. My husband, John, inherited his business from his father, William. It was a company that had been in his family for generations. Our first meeting was no coincidence. It was orchestrated by my dear friend Emily, who worried about my lack of romantic adventures. She knew John through her network and thought he'd be a perfect match for me. When I first saw him, he exuded confidence, perhaps because he knew he was set to inherit his father's company. That confidence drew me in. He seemed capable, a man who knew what he wanted and how to get it. It was undeniably attractive for me. Once we started dating, John was incredibly kind and I enjoyed talking to him. His confidence, sometimes bordering on arrogance, was apparent. But as we grew closer, I discovered his gentle and sensitive side. This made me want to spend my life with him. Five years into our relationship, John proposed, and we decided to get married. I had planned to continue working even after marriage, but John, preparing to take over his family business, said to me, Michelle, as I'll be managing the company, I want you, my wife, to quit your job and support me. I had always been career-oriented, so the idea of leaving my job seemed unthinkable. However, the thought of dedicating my life to supporting John also seemed like a worthy pursuit. So I resigned in favor of his wishes. I must say, I was regarded as quite an accomplished employee at my workplace. So when I announced my resignation, my boss tried his best to persuade me to stay. But seeing my determination, he said, We support your decision. But please remember, you're always welcome to come back. Our wedding was beautiful, with colleagues and friends gathered to celebrate. Standing there, it felt somewhat unreal. Is this really my wedding day? But John, smiling brightly beside me, filled me with happiness and hope for our future together. However, as our married life began, John's true nature started to reveal itself. Initially, he was busy preparing to take over the company and supporting him in his endeavors felt truly fulfilling. I found joy in cooking his favorite meals, keeping our home tidy, and ensuring he had a comfortable bed to rest in after a long day. Seeing him happy made all my efforts worthwhile. Thank you for always working so hard around the house. I'm so happy every day because of you, Michelle. John would often express his gratitude, filling our home with warmth and love. I would respond with a cool affection. You're always working so hard too. Being able to support you closely makes me happy as well. Being married to you is the best thing that ever happened to me. John's words were like a bomb, soothing any worries and making me feel cherished. Even my in-laws, William and Linda, would express their appreciation. We're so glad to have someone like you as our daughter-in-law. You left your job to support John, didn't you? We heard you were a standout employee at your company. It means a lot that you chose to support our son instead. Thank you so much. Knowing my former company's president was acquainted with my father-in-law, they had discussed my work and lamented my resignation from a business perspective. When we mentioned not planning for children yet, they were understanding. It's all about your timing as a couple. Take it at your pace, please. But what about an heir? We don't need to worry about that, Michelle. Times have changed. The position of president should go to whoever wants it and is capable. They reassured me. Sharing this with my friend Emily, she was impressed, 
you have such open-minded in-laws. Yes, but I feel the pressure to think about an heir, I admitted. What are you talking about? Your in-laws sound genuinely supportive. Emily counted. Do you think so? Absolutely. Flexible in-laws like yours are rare, especially with their business background. It's wonderful how they think. I really am grateful for such wonderful in-laws. I don't want to let them down, I shared, feeling a mix of appreciation and responsibility. Emily playfully remarked, If I were to marry, I'd want in-laws like yours. Don't be so rigid in your thinking. If they said not to worry, then don't worry. Her praise made me feel even more grateful for my in-laws' open-mindedness and acceptance. While I had managed to build a good relationship with them, things with John were subtly changing. Lately, he had been coming home late, citing work as the reason. He also started drinking more frequently, regardless of the time, and in significant amounts. In the early days of our marriage, John would consider the next day's commitments and often refrain from drinking too much. However, recently, he began to drink regardless of his schedule. It would have been tolerable if it just ended there. But alcohol started to bring out his irritability, and he began to take it out on me. More booze. I'm not done drinking. Bring it here. And some snacks, do. He'd demand. Okay, but... There is no but here. He'd interrupt sharply. Your only response should be less. Yes. I'd comply reluctantly. As a homemaker, you're supposed to dedicate yourself to your husband. He was bumming about such things. And then he got more and more drunk. And he was completely buzzed. I noticed this and made this remark. Maybe you should cut back a little. You're drinking too much. And you have work tomorrow. It might be best to get some sleep early. My words would trigger a change in his demeanor. He'd stand up abruptly, slam his hand on the table, and yell, What's your problem with me having a drink? I work hard and I'm tired. I just want to relax at home. Why is that an issue? Startled by his outburst, I'd step back in surprise. Realizing he'd gone too far, John would quickly apologize. I'm sorry, I've been so tired lately and I find it hard to sleep without a drink. But you're right, I've been drinking too much. I'll be more mindful. Feeling guilty, I'd apologize too. I'm sorry for not being more considerate. You must be exhausted from work. It's me who should be sorry, truly. He'd reply, remorse in his voice. I understood that taking over the company from his father, William, and becoming the president wasn't easy. The stress must be immense. I felt I should be more understanding, even though I regretted speaking out. Yet, I couldn't help but worry about how his drinking might affect his work, especially with important responsibilities the next day. As time went on, John's behavior became increasingly erratic and self-centered whenever he drank. If I tried to intervene even slightly, he would raise his voice, becoming more aggressive. You're just a homemaker. Don't criticize me. I'm the one earning for you. Supporting me is your job. Don't you dare talk back to me. He would berate. Sorry. I'd respond, trying to keep the peace. And you know what? If you were working in my company, there wouldn't be any special treatment for you. No bonuses, nothing. You were decent at your previous job, but now you're less than a housekeeper. You're worthless. He dad attacking my character and self-worth. I struggled with the stark transformation in John from the loving husband I once knew to a man who spewed harsh words under the influence of alcohol. Supporting him was becoming more and more of a burden for me. This change in his personality has further distanced our feelings from each other. Perhaps as a result, John started coming home late or not at all, more frequently. Amidst this growing estrangement, John came home early one day, saying he had something important to discuss. I've finally taken over the company. I'll be the president starting next week. He announced. Congratulations, I replied, though my heart was heavy with apprehension. I've been really busy lately and couldn't spend much time with you. I'm sorry about that. Maybe things will calm down now. How about we start thinking about having kids? He suggested. I was surprised and filled with anxiety. 
with John's temperamental changes when drinking and our current emotional disconnect. I wondered if having a child was the right decision, but the desire for a family was there, and I agreed to try, thinking perhaps this was the right time. However, just a month into our attempts to conceive, John was assigned to a business trip out of state, lasting three months, while I understood the necessity due to his work. It meant a temporary halt to our plans for starting a family. Two weeks after John left for his business trip, I started feeling unwell and decided to visit the doctor. To my surprise, I was diagnosed as pregnant. John had expressed his desire for an heir, so I thought he would be overjoyed, eager to share the news with him directly. I realized I didn't know where he was staying. So, I called his office to inquire about his whereabouts. To my shock, the response from his office was, The president is on a long vacation. We thought he was away with his family. Confused and surprised, I quickly said to cover it up. Oh, right, right. He's visiting his parents. Silly me, I forgot. And hung up the phone, my heart racing. The revelation that John wasn't on a business trip, but on a long vacation puzzled me. Alone with my thoughts, I decided to share my concerns with my friend Emily. You are pregnant. John becomes abusive when he drinks and now he's lying about being on a business trip. It's like emotional abuse, isn't it? I wondered. Emotional abuse. No, my husband is upset because I am incapable of doing nothing. It's my fault because I'm a failure. Emily was adamant. No, Michelle, it's not your fault. You're not the one to blame. This is a classic case of emotional abuse. It's not right to say that a couple is a failure. A husband and wife are supposed to complement each other. Realizing how I had been walking on eggshells around John, afraid to upset him, was a revelation I hadn't expected. You're not alone anymore. You have a child to think about. You need to start valuing yourself more. Emily advised. Her words were a wake-up call. I was not just myself anymore. I was carrying our child. Protecting my unborn baby was my sole responsibility. With newfound resolve, I decided to face John and the situation head on. Following Emily's suggestion, I hired a private investigator to find out what John was up to. The investigation revealed that John was having an affair. It was a devastating discovery. But the thought of my child gave me strength. Three months passed, and John returned from his supposed business trip, bringing his mistress along. Being pregnant, I became extremely sensitive to smells, and the strong scent of alcohol on John and his mistress was almost unbearable. I'm back and, well, I got her pregnant, so we need to get divorced. John slurred, his words cutting through me. What? I managed to say, stunned. Since there will be expenses with the baby, let's agree on no alimony. You've lived well enough as the wife of a president. You're not going to cling to my money after being cheated on, right? His mistress chimed in smigly, and they both laughed heartily. John was clearly drunk, and I didn't want to create a scene, especially considering the child growing inside me. Without resistance, I agreed to the divorce, asking only, Can I keep the house? The house? Sure, take it. I just bought a new apartment to live in with her. John boasted nonchalantly. Then please transfer the house to my name. Just take care of the paperwork, I requested. Yeah, yeah, I'll mail you the divorce papers. Make sure you file them at the town hall, he said dismissively. Understood. I'm glad it was an easy divorce. I thought to myself as they drove away, clearly drunk. An hour later, my father-in-law, William, called, confused and angry about John's sudden return with another woman and his declaration of divorce and remarriage. I recounted everything to him my pregnancy, John's abusive behavior when drunk, his lie about the business trip, and his return with his mistress, as well as his reckless drunk driving. William was furious. After the call with William, he abruptly ended the conversation with a promise of accountability. Soon after, I received a call from Linda, my mother-in-law. Michelle, John is causing a scene here, please help. 
she pleaded. It was clear that John, likely intoxicated, had become enraged after being confronted by his father. Without hesitation, I called the police and headed to my in-law's house, which was about a 15-minute drive away. Upon arrival, I found a police already there, restraining a belligerent John. In his struggle, John had pushed an officer, who hid his head on the corner of the stairs. As another officer tried to subdue him, John suddenly collapsed, presumably from the combined effects of alcohol and his outburst. An ambulance was called to take John away, while his mistress, attempting to flee the scene, was stopped by the police. We need to take you in for questioning. They told her, and she reluctantly followed. The next day, John woke up in the hospital, surprised to see me there. Why are you here? He asked, confused. I forgot to tell you something important, I replied. Once our divorce is finalized, I'll be seeking alimony and child support. What? Child support? Are you crazy? We don't have any kids. Actually, I'm pregnant. I wanted to tell you, but then you blindsided me with the divorce. Are you serious? This isn't some sort of joke. It's the truth. There's no point in lying about it here. John was visibly shocked, but something else seemed to trouble him more. You said you didn't want alimony, right? I never said that. Maybe you misremembered it that way because you were drunk? I said with a wry smile. John glared at me, his expression filled with disbelief and anger. William, John's father, interjected into our conversation with palpable fury. How could you do this to Michelle? You can't possibly think of avoiding alimony. He thundered. How did you turn into such an ungrateful person? He lamented, despair evident in his voice. John, confronted by his parents' anger, fell silent, unable to retort. I'm fine as long as I receive alimony and child support. Also, the house has been agreed to be mine. I stated firmly. What's left for me then? John asked, his voice tinged with desperation. You have your mistress and a child with her. Isn't that enough? I replied coolly. Don't joke with me. He snarled. You're not in any position to say that, John. Besides, I thought the house was in your name, but it turns out it belongs to your father. He'll handle the transfer, so please, don't bother me again. My words left John speechless, his face a mask of confusion. As we were talking, a police officer entered the room. We're here regarding yesterday's incident. There's an arrest warrant for assault. He announced. With that statement, John was apprehended for assault. The alimony and child support, at least for the time being, would be fronted by John's parents. Eventually, our divorce was finalized without any hitches. John was quickly released from custody. But the scandal of his arrest made big news, severely hampering his chances of finding new employment. Estranged now from his parents, he seemed lost, with nowhere to turn. As for Jessica, the other woman, I had a private investigator look into her background and made sure to claim a substantial alimony from her as well. Though John and Jessica eventually married, their life together was fraught with financial struggles. Jessica, pregnant and unable to work, stayed home while John worked tirelessly. Their days were filled with constant disagreements and misunderstandings, a result of their own making. As for me, William and Linda, John's parents, offered me a position at their company. However, the thought of working at the same company John had been part of didn't sit right with me. Instead, I chose to return to my previous job, where the owners, thanks to William and Linda's intervention, welcomed me back warmly. The company had a daycare, which meant I could work while knowing my child was in safe hands nearby. Though I was aware that raising a child as a single mother would be challenging, I was ready to embrace the responsibility.